All right, well, welcome to School of the Wild Citizen Science. My name is Beth Jo Wave, and I'm a naturalist here at North Chagrin Nature Center, right here behind me. Um, I've added my email address to this slide, bkj at clevelandmetroparks.com. Uh, during the presenta presentation tonight, Citizen Science, I am going to be using the iNaturalist app. And I'm going to be explaining to you how to use that on your phone, on your smartphone, and a little bit about on your computer. This is an amazing tool for citizen science. And what I would not like to see is it become a barrier for you um, to enjoying this awesome opportunity. So if at any time, you know, you start using this app, you get inspired in this program, and you want to go out and use it, if you're getting like weird error messages or you're having a hard time uploading a photo, anything like that, please hear me when I say reach out. I'll talk to you on the phone. I'll send you an email. Um, the iNaturalist webpage itself has a ton of frequently asked questions sections that can help you through some of those technical difficulties. So again, this is an amazing tool. Don't want it to be a barrier in any way that I can help. Please let me know. All right, so let's get started here. Like I said, citizen science, that is the topic of tonight's presentation. So what is it? How does citizen science work and why does it even matter? I'm going to read you off this definition so I don't mess it up here. Defined citizen science is public participation and collaboration in scientific research with a goal of increasing scientific knowledge. That's pretty outstanding, right? Um, and it starts with you. It starts with the public. It starts with me, everyone. You don't have to work in a lab like this one to be a scientist, or you don't have to have an advanced degree in one of the branches of science, many, many branches of science, to be considered a scientist. Um, you can do it just by being excited and passionate about something uh, and, and basically taking some pictures, which I'm going to show you here in a couple of minutes. Um, so find something that you're inspired by and then research it. For example, you could monitor monarch butterflies in your garden. You can tag them and track their migration. Um, you could, do you like to go skiing? You can, um, I saw that Shauna, thank you for that comment. That was wonderful. Uh, if you like to go skiing on your on vacation, you can measure the depth of the snow and the snowpack and report that. Maybe you like to kayak. You can go kayaking and take water quality uh, measurements while you're out boating. There's so many different ways to do it and different places to do it as well. Wherever you're at in life, there's citizen science for you. Literally from the ocean floor to outer space and everywhere in between are different opportunities for citizen science. Um, what I would like you to do today at the end of the presentation, since I know this is a virtual program, you're either on your computer, a tablet or a phone or something like that, you have access to Google. What I'm going to ask you to do is to pick something you're passionate about. Could be a hobby, could be an animal, could be a plant, whatever it is. Hit the plus sign and then citizen science projects and hit enter. You're going to be opened up to this entire world of citizen science opportunities that you had no idea were even there. So the goal of today's program, get inspired, get involved and become a citizen scientist. All right, so the, the main uh, program that I'm going to talk about today is called iNaturalist. So if you're following along or you want to pull up this website, feel free. It's www.inaturalist.org. And this is one of the most popular nature apps um, that you're going to be seeing people use on their smartphones. It's used to log biodiversity or the variety of species across the planet. This was an initiative by the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. And at its most basic use, you can use iNaturalist to identify something. So you're out on a hike, you see a cool flower, you see a cool bird, you take a picture of it and it can help you figure out what it is, identify it. Uh, but beyond that, it's this global platform for nature enthusiasts and scientists to come together and share information and help each other out, which I just think is so, so incredible. Um, if you look at the website here, I took a screen grab from the web page, and when I took it, this observations to date at the top right, over 63 million observations. 
I get excited when I get nine people on a hike and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all these people who are all connected. That's only nine people, right? 63 million different observations. And observations is what I'm going to show you how to do tonight. Um, and again, it's the most basic use for iNaturalist. As you play around with it and learn more about it, you're gonna discover more and more. And again, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions while you're doing that. So, <coughs> excuse me. What you'll need to do first is go to the iNaturalist website and you're going to create an account. So that's pretty basic, like creating an account anywhere. You're going to need a username, an email address, and a password. So do that first. Then you'll go to your smartphone. And from there, you'll download either from the App Store or Google Play, wherever you get your apps, you'll download the iNaturalist app. Once that's on your phone, log into it with the information that you just created on the website. Pretty easy so far, right? And again, you can follow along and do this now or come back to us later and watch this on YouTube and do it then. Um, once you get that on there, then you're able to start making your observations. Now, I've been a naturalist for over 15 years and I've worked a lot of different places, a lot of different states, but one of my first jobs as a naturalist, right outside the nature center, there was this big wooden box with a lid on it. And you'd open the lid and inside there was just a plain old notebook. And written on that notebook, it said field observations, and there was a pen in there. And what we intended was for park visitors to come and write down what they saw that day on their hike. So you put your name and the date, you'd say, I saw a great blue heron, or I saw a red fox, and any notes that you wanted to about it. And that's cool. That's data. That's information. And it was helpful to other people who were visiting because they can look at it and say, oh, my goodness, you know, I want to I want to see a dolphin. I want to know where to go to see that. And so they would read that and go there. But sometimes I would open it up in the morning and it would say, little brown bird under the feeder. We named the brown bird Bob. Bob is hungry, give Bob more seed. Is it adorable? Absolutely. And it tugs at my heartstrings and it makes me happy that this family had a cool interaction with nature and that they named this bird Bob. But is it really good scientific information? Not necessarily. So that's why this app comes into play, because it can take those cool nature moments of connectivity and inspiration, and it can make them usable um, as scientific data. So three easy steps. It couldn't be easier. First, you record an observation. That's taking a picture on your smartphone. Second, you share it with other naturalists. So that's that uploading process that I'm going to show you how to do. It's kind of like crowdsourcing and a social media aspect where other nature enthusiasts help you identify what it is that you found. And the third is to discuss your findings. And that's, again, more the identification and how it's getting used in things called projects. And I'll explain more about projects towards the end. I'm going to try to rope you into a project, actually, that's happening this weekend in Cleveland right now. All right. So now I'm going to walk you through how I do this. Again, you're going to come up with your own system as you're learning how to use this app and the web page. This is what I do, and for people who are new to the system, this is how I teach them how to do it. So when I go on a hike out in the forest, um, I take a lot of pictures while I'm out there. And I might take three, four pictures of something from different angles, different lighting, close, far away, try to get it in the center of the picture. Um, and then when I'm all done, I take a look at all of my pictures and then do my upload from there. So while I see something, um, in this example here, I see this mushroom on the left-hand side, I take a picture of the top of it. I try to make sure it's nice and clear and the background is blurry. The thing in the front is clear. And then the picture on the right, you can see I flipped it over and took a picture on the underside of it. This is an important part of identifying mushrooms, for example. So I want to make sure I have all that information on there. Now, when you're out hiking, there's going to be stuff in the background, right? So you can see in the back of that picture, I see there's definitely some sticks back there and there's some green stuff but I can't tell what planet it is, right? So there's no danger of that accidentally being the thing I'm trying to identify. It's very clear I'm trying to identify this mushroom. When you make an observation in iNaturalist, you get four photos, so use them. Even if it's like an identical photo or just a little bit different, you can add that to your observation just to help make it a little bit better. I got another example to show you here. Take a look at this. I wanted to identify this tree. So I see the bud, it's really big, it's colorful. I got all the colors right, it's in the center of my picture. You can see all the pieces, looks good. But then you look in the background and you see the tree back there and it's blurry. 
But when you take another look at the tree in the picture on the right, that's pretty unique, right? Like that is probably something that can be used to help identify that tree. So what could I do to make this observation a little bit better? Include the picture of the tree. So I walk over, take a picture of the tree, and now I have two photos. Remember, I'm allowed up to four, so two photos is just fine. All right, let me click ahead here. I'm going to check the chat and see if anybody has any questions. We doing good so far? Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Shauna. All right, I'm going to close that. So now this part of the program, if you have iNaturalist on your phone and you want to play along, go ahead and take a picture of this picture of the flower that I've got on the screen right now. And then I'm going to show you how to upload or make an observation. Again, if you don't have your phone right now, don't worry about it. You can come back to this or just, um, you know, get your first, first introduction on how to walk through these steps. So again, I take my picture here. Um, you can see I got quite a bit going on in there. I've got the petals, I've got the leaves. It's really clear, it's in the center. I know exactly what I'm talking about. That picture is gonna go to my camera roll. Then I'm going to open the iNaturalist app on my phone. When I click the button, the slide should, there we go. When I open the app, this is what comes up. So at the very top, you can see my username. So that's what you just created on the website. You get to pick a profile picture, so that'll be there as well. And then it's going to list the number of observations that you have. I know out of those, what was it, 62 million observations, 220 of those are mine. And I think that's pretty exciting. This can kind of get to be the competitive part of using iNaturalist and being a citizen scientist, right? Because I can look up, I can look up Marty Calabrese, naturalist at North Sugar Nature Center, and he's got like 3,000 observations, right? And I got to be like, oh, I got to go out and try to catch Marty Calabrese. Uh, so that's kind of fun. So you can keep track of them there. And as I scroll down through here, it'll have all the observations that I've made there. So if I forget what something looks like, or I just want to look back and see all the cool things that I found on hikes, they're listed right there. If you're brand new, there's not going to be anything in that list yet. Um, so we can we can start building your list. Um, again, the technology for this is pretty intuitive. You might come into some hiccups now and again, but I'm pretty confident that just by clicking through it, you guys will be able to figure out how it works. So if I want to make my first observation, I look down at the bottom of the screen and I can see there's a camera that says observe. I click that camera and this is what comes up. First option is no photo. I don't suggest that. If you want research quality photos and observations going on or observations going on to iNaturalist, you really need to have at least one good photo on there. If I were to click camera, that would just open the camera on my phone. Perfectly fine, you can absolutely do that. But like I said, that's just not my style. I like to take all my pictures at once and then I either go back and I sit in my car or I wait until I get back to my house with Wi-Fi to be able to upload all my pictures. Now the last one's really cool, record sound. Have you ever been standing in the forest and you hear that random bird that you just can't identify? Guess what? Now you can get some help with that. So you can just record sound and upload that and try to get these people to crowdsource these other naturalists and help you figure out what that sound is. This would work for frogs too. All right, so like I said, camera roll is where we're gonna be at for this observation. So you can see my camera roll here. Um, I have an iPhone, so that's what it looks like. It just piles all my pictures up together. This is the important part about making an observation. You only want to enter one organism at a time. So you can see I got real picture happy here and I took two pictures of this purple blue flower. Then there's three of the white one. Then I went back over to the blue one, then back to the white one. Here's some new blue ones. Oh my gosh, there's a red one. I was like all over the place when I was taking my pictures, right? You can add up to four, but make sure they're all the same thing. So you can only identify one thing at a time. You could add as many as you want, but they have to be their own individual observations. All right, so I'm gonna pick that white flower, that one that I showed you on the previous screen. Again, if I wanted to add more, there's a little square with the plus sign. I could touch that on my phone and add more pictures if I wanted to. Underneath that, it says, what did you see? Skip that for just a second. I'm going to come back to it. Down there in the notes section, this is what makes 
iNaturalist different from that brown box outside the nature center with the observation field notebook in it because it attaches data to your observation that makes it usable by scientists. So the very top right there has the date and the time of when I made the observation. Below that is the location all the way down to latitude and longitude. Under that is geo privacy. So when you take a photo and make an observation, you can choose to make its location private or you can skew it, like blur it. Can you think of a reason why that would be important? When would you want to not share the location of a specific organism? Sometimes I do it when I take pictures of things in my yard. I don't wanna share my yard with everybody on my naturalist or the location of my yard. Um, maybe it is an animal or an organism um, that is exploited in the wildlife trade. On iNaturalist, we're a community of naturalists and we should all be in this for conservation and protection of species, but people who mean to do harm in the world don't play by the rules. So there is that option to do that geo privacy. And yes, Shauna, excellent. It could be uncommon and you don't wanna to draw too many people to it. You wanna record it, but you wanna keep that location private. Captive cultivated is next. And this one, this one's important too. I, mean, I got a couple silly examples, but it's important. Um, so what I don't want to do is go to the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, take a bunch of pictures of elephants, upload them to iNaturalist, identify them and be like elephants all over Cleveland, Ohio. Somebody who's studying elephants and trying to figure out the range or look at their population sizes, they might be very confused to hear that we have elephants in Cleveland. So I would click captive there, and then that would denote that I was in the zoo. Um, cultivated is another example. This is a little bit more applicable uh, example. I've got some native wildflowers planted in my yard. I can take pictures of them and upload them as an observation, but I need to click cultivated because I planted them. They're doing well, they're thriving, they're healthy, but they weren't found there naturally. So that's when you would use that. And finally, projects. This is the exciting part. This is when you can sit at the computer or on your phone and just go for hours researching all different kinds of plants and animals across the globe. If you ask yourself, hey, how many moths are in Japan? There's a project for that. And you're only going to see moths of Japan. Maybe you're super excited about dragonflies in Ohio and you wanna know where they're at, how many they are, how many species, you can join that project and track those. Again, I have an exciting project I'm going to try to rope you into at the end of this presentation. Um, so projects, you can definitely click on those. But now I'm going to go back up to that, what did you see? And again, this is probably the most common, commonly used uh, aspect of this app, is just to identify things. So you're going to go ahead and touch, what did you see? <clears throat> I will warn you, this step sometimes takes a few seconds. So you might get that wheel or the hourglass. What it's doing is trying to identify your picture and then populate a list of results underneath to tell you what it is. So you can see at the very top here, it says, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Trillium. The way I use iNaturalist is I'll take the picture, I'll say, what did you see? And when it tells me we're pretty sure, I go to Trillium and I say, okay, and I hit that little I next to it. And it gives me a little bit more, uh, a little bit more information on what that trillion plant is and what it looks like. So you can read that and see if you agree with it. This is the time where I break out the field guides. Again, I've been a naturalist for a really long time, but I'm not afraid to admit to you, field guides can sometimes be difficult. I can talk myself in and out of a lot of different answers when I try to key things out, and they're sometimes difficult to use. So if I can get narrowed down to trilliums, then I go grab my field guide and I flip through trilliums, and then I look at the identification there and try to figure out which one specifically I have. So I did that. I decided that I actually had large white trillium, which is the first suggestion right here on iNaturalist. It's kind of hard to see in the green that they use, but it says visually similar to the picture, so that's good, and seen nearby. So that would be really weird if I, it suggested a plant that was like native to South Africa and I'm standing here in Cleveland, then I would question that. So I guess the moral of this is, is are the suggestions always correct? 
No. So you might want to double check them with a the field guide or hit that little eye and really read the details to make sure that you're trying to identify it as the right thing. Um, the good news, though, is even if you mess up the identification completely, that community aspect is going to come in and someone's going to say, hey, actually, let's double let's double check this. I think maybe we've got something else. So no stress. But I do know that it's a large white trillium. So I'm going to click that. And that brings me back to my screen here for my observation. I'm going to double check, make sure everything's good. Got my flower, got my ID, all my notes are in place. The last thing I have to do is click share. I have just citizen scienced. How exciting. So now that large white trillium is in my list of observations. And I'm going to give it a few days, maybe a week or two, just give it a little bit of time. And eventually, you can see at the very end of that, there's a little gray box with a number one in it. I'm going to go ahead and click that. And I'm going to see that another member of the community, another naturalist, has come in and said, hey, I agree with your identification of large white trillium. It's so exciting, right? It makes you feel so validated. It makes you feel so smart. You're like, yes, I do know what I'm doing. So she came in and she said, yep, I think this is large white trillium. I'm going to put this note here. Now, let me make sure I got my numbers right here. Once you have an observation and two out of three people commenting on that identification, when they all agree, your observation then becomes research grade. That's what you're shooting for. Everyone agreeing on that identification as correct, and then it can be used, like I said, in these projects and all these different examples of science and biodiversity across the globe. Now, there's some caveats to that. Somebody might come in here and disagree and say, no, Beth, I really, I don't think that's it. Take a look at this identification. Or they, in the notes, they can ask more questions, like what was the habitat? Where were you? Do you have any more pictures? So again, there's that social aspect here, which I think is really just so cool. And that's it. That's citizen science. It's as easy as that. So who's ready for a test? I should have warned you at the beginning that it was going to be a test. Um, I have three pictures up here. If you have your cell phone on you and you would like to try to pick one of these or do all three of them and go through the steps that I just described, go for it. Um, just don't actually hit share. You never want to share a photo of a photo or a photo from a book because that's not a real observation and that doesn't help move science forward, right? So you only want to actually share the ones that you actually see in the wild. So if you're going to be doing that, I'm just going to give you a couple tips, a few lessons learned things while you're working on that. Um, true confession, this is what most of the pictures on my cell phone look like. And I know I just told you, oh, make sure you're close and you get all the different angles and the background's not too busy. Well, in that middle picture, you can clearly see the giant water snake of North Sugar Reservation back there. Um, but again, what I'm going to tell you is be patient with yourself. Try to get as close as you can safely. Zoom in if you can, and just take a lot of pictures. That way you have a lot to choose from. So if one doesn't come out quite as well as you thought, you can pick some different ones for your actual observation. And again, there's nothing saying you have to share it. You could use that first picture, go through all the steps and get the suggestions for the ID. And if you're not really sure that it's right because of the quality of your picture, you can just close it out and back it out and you never have to upload it. You never have to share your subpar quality picture with anybody um, again, or you could share it and then somebody can come on and just comment and say, hey, we're going to need a little bit better picture here to get you like a really good observation. So I'm going to check the chat. Did anybody have any guesses as to what these are, or maybe you just know what they are and you, uh, you just guessed. Um, let's see. Cultivated, what about volunteer plants that show up in your yard? Nope, volunteer plants, you go ahead and, and click uh, upload it as an observation. Don't click cultivated because you didn't plant it. Volunteer means it showed up on its own, either by wind dispersal or a bird brought it to your yard. So good question. Thank you for clarifying that. Harry Woodpecker for that first one. That's kind of a tough one, right? Because I'm so far away, it's kind of hard to judge size. That bill, that beak is kind of hard to see. I was standing right there, you know, I took the picture, I uploaded it, and the the what I think you found or whatever that top thing said was, we're pretty sure you have a, 
it just said woodpeckers. And I could have left it just at that, right? I could have left it at that big, broad um, kind of organizational level of identification and then left it to other naturalists to identify. But I was standing there, I was pretty close. That bill is really short. That is actually a downy woodpecker. But that I'm glad you said that because that's the perfect example of when sometimes I naturalist is a little tricky. That middle picture right there is a red bellied woodpecker. And again, difficult, right? I didn't get that red stripe on the back. I only got a little bit of half side wing and the breast of the bird on there. And again, that distracting snake in the background. So I could have just left that too at just that woodpecker uh, level of organization. How about the last one? My favorite non bird bird feeder species. Eastern gray squirrel. That one came up really easy. That was actually a decent picture of that guy, right? So that one was easy to find. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to close that. All right. So now you've practiced it. You know, hold on one second. Let me click that, click there. Okay. You know what citizen science is. You know how it works. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why it matters. So that is the City Nature Challenge 2021. So this is an opportunity for you to use iNaturalist and take part in a global biodiversity a-thon to see how many different organisms across the world we can upload during a specific set time. So um, this event started in 2016. I'm gonna read this off to you so I don't get it wrong. It was the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And it was just a friendly competition. They were like, hey, I wanna see who can find more biodiversity in their urban areas over the course of this week. And they had a friendly little competition. Well, it took off and it grew and it grew and it grew. And last year, it included 244 cities across the world. Pretty exciting. So it went from two cities up to 244. Um, all competing in this big challenge. So now that you know how to use the iNaturalist app, you can take part in the City Nature Challenge 2021. And you will be, well, depending on where you're watching from, I'm gonna read you some counties here in a minute. The Cleveland Akron Canton Project. So remember I told you about those projects, how addicting they are? This is a cool one to join. So if you are in the following counties, and you make an observation with your iPhone or your, your smartphone, all you have to do is upload that observation and everything else will be automatically populated to this project. All right, <clears throat> here are the counties. Listen for your county. Cuyahoga, Lake, Geauga, Medina, Lorraine, Portage, Summit, Stark, Carroll, Ashtabula, Tuscaroras, Erie, and Huron. Now, again, you don't have to do anything, just be standing physically in one of those counties when you take that picture to make that observation. But I suggest that you go online and join this um, project so you can just see all the different organis uh, organisms that are being uploaded. Um, and I'm not really a sports fan. I'm, I don't follow any ball sports, but again, you know, I find this competition really exciting because it's friendly, but you can also keep track with all the tallies. So I would say to you, enter your rival city name here and take them on in the 2020 uh, City Nature Challenge. So earlier today, I checked the leaderboard for this competition. It started April 30th, and it's going to go until May 3rd. So today is May 1st. You just learned how to use the iNaturalist app. You still have two more days to go out and make observations. Um, after that, there's going to be about a week of identifying what those observations are, and then the totals will be tallied. Um, but earlier today, I can't remember, it was like one o'clock today, I took this screenshot of the leader, the current leaderboard. And you can see that so far, there are over 300,000 observations, 21,000 species. I think that's 47,000 identifiers. So that's other people going in and making those identifications, that little comment box on the observations, and over 20,000 observations. That's outstanding. Again, I'm excited about nine people on a hike, right? All of these people out enjoying nature, connecting with each other and adding to the scientific um, knowledge base of biodiversity ac across the globe. So if you look at this list, if you've been kind of creeping on it, looking at it while I've been talking, you'll notice that Cleveland's not on the top ones yet, but we still have time. 
well, uh, around three o'clock today is when I pulled this for Cleveland. 1,300 observations, pretty good. Over 400 species, outstanding. 111 people in there identifying those observations and 170 different observations. That's pretty good showing. But I would like to see, how many participants did I say was in this program? Six? I'd like to see that number increase by at least six by tomorrow. So no pressure, but that would be super cool. So remember what we talked about today. Citizen science is for everyone. Whatever your interest is, whatever your ability is, you can be a citizen scientist. Remember what I challenged you with in the beginning? I know you're sitting at your computer now, so I know you can do this as soon as you log out from here. Go to Google, enter your interest or a hobby, plus sign citizen science projects, and go out there, get inspired, get involved, and become a citizen scientist. Thank you guys so much for joining today. I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording, um, but please check out clevelandmetroparks.com for upcoming programs, both in person and virtual. And then I'm going to double check. I'm going to pop into that chat just to make sure there's no other questions. Thank you guys so much for joining tonight.